Peter's on the phone. Hold on. Sorry, I'm late. Uh, wrapping up some business. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, the president this morning met with General McMaster. As you know, uh, General McMaster is helping lead the team that's organizing the president's upcoming foreign trip. And this week, the president has been focused on meeting with the team, uh, getting ready for the various stops that he'll be making and meetings that he's going to be having. During his many conversations with world leaders, the president has seen a great desire for America to re-engage and be a leader once again in helping solve the world's complex problems. And he's already made uh, moves both behind the scenes with leaders and his public statements to show them that America is reasserting its leadership on the world stage. These visits are another important part of this American resurgence. While on the trip, the President will further our strategic objectives in the region, creating new opportunities that will strengthen the United States and our allies while weakening our enemies. I know many of you are interested in the logistical aspects of this trip, and we'll be trying to have further briefings throughout the week on, on those aspects of the trip uh, as soon as we can, so stay tuned. Uh, also on the subject of foreign visits, I'd like to announce that the President has invited the Crown Prince of the United Arab Emirates to visit the White House on May 15th. Uh, and the Crown Prince has accepted. We look forward to welcoming the Crown Prince and see the visit as an opportunity to deepen cooperation with a key partner in the Middle East. Uh, moving on to domestic matters, the Vice President spent his morning today on Capitol Hill. He met privately with Majority Leader McConnell and also had individual meetings with other senators. The discussions focused primarily on the path forward for the American Health Care Act in the Senate and how the administration can work with Congress to craft a tax reform bill that follows the President's priorities, simplification, providing tax relief to the American families and, and individuals, and stimulating the economy. The Vice President also attended the weekly Senate Republican Policy Lunch. Later this afternoon, the Vice President will be joined by Second Lady Karen Pence, General McMaster, and Ivanka Trump to welcome more than 150 military families of all branches of service for a reception at the White House. The event recognizes National Military Appreciation Month and National Military Spouse Appreciation Day, which takes place this Friday. The President's Cabinet is busy inside and out of the Beltway, speaking on the Administration's agenda with local officials and key stakeholders. Secretary of Health and Human Services Dr. Tom Price is in Michigan in West Virginia today, where he will hear from those on the front lines of the fight against the opioid epidemic. Also today, the Justice Department uh, announced that Attorney General will be speaking on opioids on Thursday at a Drug Enforcement Administration 360 Heroin and Opioid Response Summit in Charleston, South Carolina. The DEA's 360 strategy is designed to help cities and surrounding regions deal with the heroin and prescription drug abuse epidemic and the violent crime associated with it. This day-long event, sponsored by the DEA, Anti-Drug Coalitions of America, and the University of Charleston School of Pharmacy, will bring together stakeholders and professionals working in law enforcement, prevention, education, treatment, recovery, health care, and emergency response. In Washington, Secretary of Commerce Ross is speaking this afternoon at the 47th Conference of the Americas, which is taking place at the State Department. The event brings together administration officials, distinguished leaders from across the region to focus on major policy issues affecting the hemisphere. Also at the State Department this morning, Secretary Tillerson participated in a signing ceremony for the United States-Georgia General Security of Information Agreement with the Prime Minister of Georgia, a major milestone in security cooperation between our two countries. The President was also pleased to see several top administration officials recently move through the Senate. Last night, Heather Wilson uh, was confirmed to be Secretary of the Air Force, and Governor Branstad was approved by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee to be Ambassador to China and is moving on for a vote on the floor of the Senate. The President also looks forward to seeing Dr. Scott Gottlieb confirmed by the full Senate to serve as Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration later today. Finally, with regard to the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, the President has been meeting with his team uh, for quite a while on this matter, and he will not be making an announcement regarding that agreement until after he returns from the G7. Uh, with that, I'd be glad to take your questions. Caitlin. Thank you, Sean. We have two questions for you today. The first one is, why did the President wait 18 days to fire Mike Flynn after the White House was informed of his conduct and warned that he was a potential target for Russian blackmail? Because you realize the timing of this makes a lot of people think that he wouldn't have been fired if the story had not come out in the media. Well, I think, first of all, let's look at the timeline. Um, Sally Yates came here on the 26th of January. Uh, then she informed uh, the counsel's office that there were 
uh, materials that were relevant to the situation. Uh, it wasn't until about seven days later that they had access to those documents. After that time, uh, they did what you should do, frankly, is an element of due process reviewing the situation. Uh, they informed the president right away after they were informed of her, uh, her giving us a heads up. And ultimately, the president made the right decision. But uh, I, I guess the question or the, the, the point that I would put back on you is uh, somebody came over, gave us a heads up on a situation, told us there were materials. Uh, we were provided those materials seven days later, reviewed those materials, underwent a process of uh, reviewing the situation, and ultimately the president made a decision and it was the right one. So uh, I, I think that the, the, the process worked, frankly, when you think of the time um, in which we had the, the information to make the decision that the president made. Well, you're saying the president stands by that decision and he made the right decision, but why does he continue to defend Mike Flynn? Well, I, I don't think it's, it's not a question of defending Mike Flynn or not. He hold, hold on. He's a witch hunt and he should seek immunity. Right. I think Mike Flynn um, is somebody who honorably served our country in uniform for over 30 years. Um, and I think, as he's noted, Lieutenant General Flynn was, was a asked for his resignation because he misled the Vice President. But beyond that, I think he did have an honorable um, career. He served with distinction in uniform for over 30 years, and the President does not want to smear a good man. What was his role at the White House in those 18 days? Was he still fulfilling his normal national security advisor duties? Yeah, I'm not going to get back into it. I will say, as I mentioned, the time. Is it worrisome that he was still doing that when he was a potential target you know, of Russian but, but blackmail? Can I just one thing that I think is important to note is, is let's look at, again, how this came down. A, someone who is not exactly um, a supporter of the President's agenda, who a couple days after this first conversation took place refused to uphold a lawful order of the President's, um, who is not exactly someone that, that was excited about President Trump uh, taking office or his, or his agenda. She had been, hold on, Caitlin, Caitlin, hold on, no, Caitlin, let me answer the question. She had come here, given a heads up, told us there were materials, and at the same time we did what we should do. Just because someone comes in and gives you a heads up about something and says, uh, I want to share some information, it doesn't mean that you immediately jump the gun and go take an action. I think if you flip this scenario and say, what if we had just dismissed somebody because a political opponent of the President had made an utterance, you would argue that it was pretty uh, irrational to act in that manner. We did what we were supposed to do. The President made ultimately the right decision. Um, and I think he was proven that that uh, How that is she a political opponent. Of the president? She was. I, 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 she's the I, acting attorney general that he the, appointed on. by the Obama administration and a strong opponent, a strong supporter of the of Clinton. So that's now I think number four. So, Jim. Um, thank you, Sean. Um, are the cancel meetings a, a sign the president is vacillating on the Paris Accord and undecided whether to remain in the agreement or withdraw from it? You know, I think it's simply is. Uh, a sign that the president wants to continue to meet with his team, um, develop a, a um, meet with not just the, the national, the economic piece, but his environmental team and come to a decision on what's the best interest of the United States uh, using the expertise that surrounds him. Well, okay, tomorrow. Does the president want to win the war in Afghanistan? Yes. What would winning mean to him? I think reducing the threat, um, especially when it comes to ISIS and the Taliban. Reducing the threat. Well, I mean, minimizing, eliminating, but obviously, in, in the in the in the best case scenario, we want major. I'm going to answer Mara's question. I think the answer is is that we want to eliminate the threats that uh, are against our, our national security and our pose a threat to uh, our citizens, our allies. Um, so we we need to fully eliminate um, any threat around the globe, frankly, not just in Afghanistan, that poses a threat to our people and our allies. I just have a question as he considers what to do next and if he wants to commit more troops. At one point we had 100,000 troops there and we didn't eliminate the threat. Why would 15,000 do the trick if 100,000 did before? Well, I think that's, you know, that's a very Washington question, meaning you, just because you spend more, throw more people, doesn't mean you're doing it in the most effective way. I think one of the things that he has asked his national security team to do is to actually think the stra rethink the strategy. What are we doing to achieve the goals that you are asking about? How do we actually, um, how do we win? How do we eliminate the threat? Um, and I think doing that isn't just a question of throwing money or people, but looking at the mission and the strategy, and that's what the team has been doing holistically, not just in Afghanistan, but the total um, beyond Afghanistan, it's also an, uh, the way that he's asking them to look at the threat and that, that ISIS was. Decision. Will he explain this to the American people or will be this something coming well, we'll out? See. I mean, I, I don't want to get in front of, I don't know what, how he's going to do that. Um, 
but we'll wait and see and go from there. John. Thanks a lot, Sean. A question about the President's policy concerning Syria. This morning we learned from the Pentagon that the President has approved a plan to directly arm Syrian Kurds against ISIS. Has the President discussed this plan with the leader of Turkey, and what was the reaction from Turkey? Uh, I don't know if he's uh, addressed this to the President yet. I do know that yesterday the President authorized the Department of Defense to equip Kurdish elements of the Syrian Democratic Forces as necessary to ensure a clear victory over ISIS in Raqqa, Syria. The, SFD, the SDF partnered with enabling support from U.S. and coalition forces are the only force on the ground that successfully sees Raqqa in the near future. We're keenly aware of the security concerns of our coalition partners in Turkey. Uh, we want to reassure the people and the government of Turkey that the U.S. is committed to preventing additional security risks and protecting our NATO ally. Uh, the U.S. continues to prioritize support for Arab elements of the SDF. Raqqa and all liberated territories should return to the governance of local Syrian Arabs. Uh, the fight for Raqqa will be long and difficult, but ultimately uh, yet another defeat for ISIS and another step towards eliminating the ISIS threat uh, that threatens peace and security in the region and the world. The uh, Secretary of State is meeting today with his counterpart from Russia today. The Foreign Minister of Russia, Sergey Lavrov. Mm -hmm. Are you expecting any deliverables from that particular meeting? I, I think we'll have a readout when that's done. I'll, Olivia. Uh, thanks, Sean. Um, I've got two for you. First, uh, do you expect the Afghan review and the ISIS review to be done by the time the President heads to Saudi Arabia? Um, I don't want to. That's that's a question that I'm going to leave up to uh, the national security team. I'm not going to. The, the President's not putting a deadline on that. We're making sure that he – this is obviously what we announced today is part of that. Uh, it is not entirely it, and we will have more uh, as we go forward. I just don't want to pin down a timeline on that. Let, One more. Um, in this briefing, you've talked about the President's desire to, quote, fully eliminate any threat around the globe to U.S. interests. You've talked about the United States wanting to re-engage and be a leader once again and reasserting its leadership on the world stage. Some of the President's supporters are going to hear in those comments um, maybe uh, a, a bad omen about the president changing his mind and becoming more interventionist. Not saying he wasn't going to be interventionist because he talked about ISIS a fair amount, but what would you tell them about, uh oh, is he going to embark now on nation building? Is he going to deepen American involvement in conflicts in, in Syria and Afghanistan and elsewhere? No, I, I appreciate that. I think that uh, his priorities remain the same, but he's going to do what he can to make sure that he protects the country and our people. Um, and threats that directly affect the United States. Brian. Thank you. Uh, just following up, and correct me if I'm wrong, I know you will, but the day after uh, it was announced that um, he was under investigation, Flynn, he met with, if I'm correct, with Pence and the Russian, and Russians on a phone call. So while he's under investigation, why is he being allowed to participate? As a national I, I really don't recall the schedule from that day, Brian's up. But, well, but the point is, again, I, I think this is, look, I, I answered the question a moment ago. But I think as I went through the timeline, um, Sally Yates came over here, gave us a heads up, provided us uh, the opportunity, made it very clear that materials were available uh, for the council to review. But, um, and, and we followed that process. And within 11 days after that, we accepted General Flynn's resignation that the president had asked for. Being while he's under investigation. I understand, but what is look, we're not going to relitigate the past on this. I think we've been very clear as to what uh, what happened and why it happened. I think the president made the right decision, uh, and and we've moved on. Like, can you confirm that uh, the meeting today between Ivanka Trump and uh, Mr. Pruitt was canceled, and if so, why? I, I don't know. Uh, I'd be glad to get back to you on that. I, I'm not sure. And secondly, um, as it relates to the G7, you said the decision on the Paris, uh, Paris climate agreement will be made after the G7. So does the President feel that he can extract any concessions um, while he's there? Does he feel like he can renegotiate it? Or does he just want more time? Why until after the G7? I think the, the President wants to make sure that uh, he has an opportunity to continue to meet with his team to create the best um, strategy for this country going forward. Sarah Murray, welcome back. Miss, Mrs. Just Mrs. Sarah Morty. Congratulations. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I just want to get back to Olivier's point. I mean, why shouldn't President Trump's supporters, if he does decide to add more troops to Afghanistan, see that as running counter to what he campaigned on for so long? The notion of America first, the notion of, you know, the fact that we're too involved in foreign entanglements abroad. He campaigned on that. And 
the way he's governed, I think, well, from what we've seen in Syria and from what he's considering in Afghanistan, seems to send a very different message. I just want to be clear. The, the one thing that there is a difference between um, Afghanistan proper and our, our effort to defeat ISIS. And that's one thing that he was also very clear on in the campaign that, um, and as president, that he is going to do everything he can uh, to fight radical Islamic terrorism, to root out and destroy ISIS. Um, in some cases, if ISIS, where he has to go into Afghanistan, that's, they may be synonymous at that point, uh, but they are not always the same, uh, right? You can be in, the goal is always going to be defeat ISIS, which is something that he's been very clear on uh, with the American people from the get-go. Um, but that all being said, let's be clear, um, with the exception of the piece that we announced today uh, that the President authorized yesterday, no decision has been made. So let's, let's not get ahead of um, what, what that ultimate policy will be. One other question. Can you just give us a better sense of what the President has been doing with his time the last few days? We haven't had very detailed schedules. We haven't been seeing him publicly. He's only had, you know, one or two meetings. So what is he actually doing no. all day long? Thanks. I mean, as I said at the top, the President's going on a nine-day, eight-day trip. Um, he's going, you know, to Saudi Arabia, Israel, Rome, G7, NATO. Um, this is an opportunity. Next week, as I mentioned, he's going to have the Crown Prince here. He's got a commencement speech at the Coast Guard Academy. Part of the use of this week is to be meeting with uh, the principals and the head of the directorates of the countries that we're going to ahead of the meetings, uh, where he's ex he receiving extensive briefings throughout the week with his team. He's had several meetings with General McMaster over the last couple of weeks, who's one of the leaders in the effort for this trip. Uh, he's met with the chief of staff, his legislative team. He was just meeting when I walked out of the Oval Office with his part of his economic team. Um, so this is an opportunity for him uh, to get ahead of this first really long foreign trip to make sure that he is on a whole host of issues, whether it's ISIS, whether it's our economic issues or trade issues, to make sure that we, um, we go in there, strengthen our relationships, uh, but also make sure that we put America's priorities first. Yeah. President Trump tweeted yesterday that the story of possible collusion between his campaign and Russia is a hoax, and he questioned when this taxpayer-funded charade would end. Um, is the administration trying to set parameters on what Congress and the FBI should investigate? No. And so, and, and, and if that is the case, so what was, what did the president mean by when will this charade end? Well, I, I think even Director Clapper said yesterday when asked if there was any evidence that he had seen of collusion, he said no. And I think that at some point, um, you know, I said it before in this briefing room, but uh, we have to take no for an answer. He said that the, the, the director of national intelligence asked, has there been anything that you've seen additionally that shows collusion? He answered very clearly. The answer is no. And it continues to be no. And I think that there's a point at which all of the things that the president is doing um, economically and in national security wise uh, to move the country forward uh, is this this needs to we need to take no for an answer and move on to the issues but is, it, but is it the role of Congress and the FBI to say when a matter should be concluded and not the White House and then also following up on that uh, Senator Lindsey Graham has said that he wants to look into um, uh, President Trump's uh, business dealings to see if there are any connections to Russia would the White House cooperate with that yeah, uh, so the President obviously uh, was aware of Senator Graham's suggestion after he made it today, and he's fine with that. Um, he has no business in Russia. He has no connections to Russia, so he welcomes that. Uh, in fact, he has uh, already charged a leading law firm in Washington, D.C. to send a certified letter to Senator Graham uh, to that point, that he has no connections to Russia. So that should be a really easy look. Matt. Thanks, Sean. Uh, two questions on two different topics. Uh, first, you said that uh, Sally Yates was a strong supporter of Hillary Clinton. What is that based on? I, I think she's made some, you know, I think she, she was widely rumored to play a large role in the Justice Department if Hillary Clinton had won. Oh. Um, so on a, on a different topic, I have a question about that fired usher, Angela Reed. Mm -hmm. uh, it was reported that she received a generous severance package. I'm wondering how do you give a substantial severance package to a government employee? I don't know. I'd be glad to get back to you on that. Sure. Anita. Um, yesterday we learned that Rosalie Yates had said that she learned of the first immigration order, the travel ban, by reading the newspaper. And I'm wondering why the acting attorney general wasn't privy to that. Was that because she was a Clinton, Obama, Obama appointee, Clinton supporter? Why was the acting attorney general not notified? And she had just met that same day that it was signed with Don McCain. So he could have mentioned it as well. I, I don't 
I don't know why she wasn't. Uh, again, I think if we want to relitigate the first executive order at the time, we talked about all of the proper individuals that needed to be made aware of were made aware of at the time. Is it not unusual that the I, I don't. I, again, I, I think it, I also, just to be clear, again, remember, this is someone who ultimately didn't even want to enforce it. Uh, so to prove, I mean, to, to suggest that somehow. Until she knew I, I understand that, but I think ultimately we were proved right about who needed to be in the loop on that because she ultimately chose to disregard the president's lawful order. It was on purpose, though, is what no, I didn't say that. Please don't. I, I did not say that. What I'm saying is that we discussed at the time of the executive order being signed back in January uh, the process by which that was followed. Uh, the appropriate people then were, were in the loop on that. Sarah. Uh, yesterday in her testimony, Sally Yates said that she arranged for White House counsel to view the evidence against General Flynn at the DOJ, but she wasn't around to see if that happened. You said that that took place seven days after her initial meeting. Um, was the evidence against Flynn relayed to the president at that time, or did the president learn about the allegations against Flynn through the media 18 days later? Um, so the Following the meeting, the White House counsel immediately informed the President and senior White House personnel uh, when she first came here. Late on Friday the 27th, uh, Yates and the White House counsel met again to discuss certain issues that, that she had left unclear at the time. Um, and then um, those, the President, as you know, fired her on the 30th of January after she refused to enforce the President's legal executive order, contrary to the advice of career DOJ officials at the time, who had given told her that this was legal, she overrode them, didn't do this. The White House didn't get access to that underlying evidence described by Ms. Yates until Thursday, February 2nd, which is a week after Ms. Yates first met with the White House counsel. Uh, and then that's when I think the, the, the full sort of review began once they had had access to that information. Was the president informed at that time? I, I know he was informed was at the front end of what she had told him, and the council had informed them that they were going to then seek uh, the information that she said was available to them. Hallie. Two different topics for you. I want to uh, follow up on what a couple of folks have already mentioned here. You've described in this briefing what Sally Yates did as a heads up with Don McGahn. She has testified she came to the White House twice in person to meet with Don McGahn on the 26th and the 27th to do more, she says, than simply offer to provide material. She says she encouraged the White House to act and expressed real concern about Mike Flynn being compromised by the Russians. On the 28th, Saturday, Mike Flynn sat in on that Oval Office phone call with President Putin. Was that the right call? Again, I think to the, what, what you have is somebody who was an Obama appointee coming in and saying, I'm giving. I get it, but but you know, but 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 at that moment, sure, you have someone who you have to wonder whether why they're telling you something to the point where they had to come back a second time because what they were saying was unclear. So let me follow up on that because you and before I get to the second topic, you said it was widely rumored that she wanted to be a part of the Clinton White House potentially, and so that makes you negate her coming to. No, the, I'm not. I, again, that, that no, no. I, I guess my point is that somebody who is not who clearly showed by the fact that career DOJ attorneys told her that the president's lawful order, uh, to, to, that she should sign the president's lawful order, and then chose not to do it was clear. I, I get it, but that, that vindicates the president's point, that this was not somebody who was looking out. I, 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 I think my point is, is that we were correct in the assumptions that we made at the time. Trey. Yeah, my my Trey. second topic for you, though, is just on health care. Yeah. Is the White House asking Senate leadership to put more women on the working group? I'm not aware of that. Try. Would the White House like to see that? I, I think the more voices that we can put on a panel uh, to help get this done, the better. Um, so to the extent I'm not going to tell Leader McConnell or the White House is not going to tell him how to conduct a panel. Um, but at the same time, I think that any voices that can be constructive in getting uh, a more patient-centric health care system put together, uh, you know, would be welcome. But that's not our call to make. Try. There's been a number of conversations in Washington this week about the relationship between H.R. McMaster and the President. How does President Trump characterize his relationship with his national security advisor? Excellent. Uh, another follow-up question yeah. very quickly on Flynn. Uh, you've spoken from the podium before about the President led, asking uh, Michael Flynn to resign as a result of him misleading the Vice President. We've learned a lot about Michael Flynn this week. Um, and potential investigations, and we know actual investigations uh, into his actions before coming here to the White House. Was this at all considered in the President's decision to ask him to resign? 
I think you can only I mean you can only accept someone's resignation once. So he asked for it, he got it, and so to go back and relitigate uh, isn't really something that makes a ton of sense. He got it, he asked for it, he got it the first time. I don't think you go back and continue to say, would I have asked for it here, here, and here? He did what he did the first time, he was right, and he got it. Amen. Uh, thanks, Sean. Can you just be clear on the 18 days? Did the White House put any security restrictions on Mike Flynn at all during that period of time? Was he uh, limited in terms of his access to classified information, national secrets, or decision making in any way? I'm not aware of any. Was that mistaken retrospective? I, I can't. This is, it doesn't, the, the decision that we made was the right one. The President made a decision, he stands by it. Jenna. Uh, Yates coming to the White House on January 26th and the 27th. You then have McGahn going to the DOJ on February 2nd uh, to see those documents. Um, but it's not until February 13th um, that uh, Flynn actually resigns. Well, tell us what happened between, you know, you got this warning, you then saw documents that backed up that warning, and then you have 11 days that passed. What, what was happening in those 11 days? I, I think if you go back in time and look at what we talked about at the time, uh, there were several conversations that occurred with General Flynn between uh, the Chief of Staff, the General Counsel, the Vice President, that all occurred then. I, look, we took, when you think about the scope of time that actually occurred, those 11 days, uh, to make sure that we did the right thing uh, is important. And we ultimately did, and that's what's important when you think of this. And when you look at this compared to other instances, the idea that in 11 days a review was conducted, the president acted decisively. I think that's that's actually shows that the system worked properly. John, Are you guys disputing at all how Yates describes those conversations on the 26th and 27th. She's saying that she came here with great urgency, that she made clear that he had been compromised, that she had evidence that he had been compromised, that this was something that she felt like the White House was going to take action on. I, I Well, look, I'm not going to – I don't think that there's 100 percent agreement uh, about how she describes everything, but I think generally as far as the timeline goes, we're fine with it. Um, but I'm, again, I'm not going to nitpick the fact that her – you know, what her tone was like. I would suggest that the reason that she was asked to come back the second day was because it wasn't – it clearly wasn't that clear on the first day. Um, so if it – I mean, I, I think logic dictates you don't ask someone to come back and explain themselves a second time if they have done an effective job the first time. Uh, but again, I'm not going to get into needling every little point about what happened. John. Thank you, Sean. I have two questions on of course. diverse areas. First, um, a citizens group known as United Against a Nuclear Iran uh, released a list of 16 American companies a few days ago, among them Volvo, Honeywell, and Schlumberger. Well, all of which are cutting back on jobs employing Americans, but all of which expressed a desire to do business in Iran under the terms of the deal that was made with Tehran. Um, my question is this, what is the administration's response to businesses who say they want to do business in Iran under a deal the President described as the worst ever? I, I think that speaks for itself. I mean, the president's very clear on what he thinks of the Iran deal, and companies need to abide by the law. All right. My other question is this. Two weeks ago, Monday, when the president met with some of us, he said, and it was on the record, he would have an answer on the administration's policy toward the International Monetary Fund in a few days. Uh, it's been two weeks. Can we expect any time an announcement on what the administration will do regarding the IMF? Uh, I would be glad to follow up on that one and get back to you. Dave. John, uh, the governor of Texas on Sunday signed a law that essentially outlaws sanctuary cities in the state of Texas. Do you view this as a, as a positive uh, step, and, and um, would you encourage other states to do the same? Uh, you know, obviously it's a positive step. I think it shows that, as we've discussed here, both from an economic and a security standpoint, that makes sense uh, for the citizens of, of our country. Each governor, each mayor is going to have to make their own decisions, but I think the President's position is very clear when it comes to sanctuary cities uh, and how we're going to try to address them going forward. Uh, because it's not just an economic issue, it's not just a jobs issue, uh, but it's, an, it's a security issue for our country. Um, and so I think ultimately every elected official from the local level all the way up to President 
uh, needs to feel comfortable with the laws that they're passing to make sure that they're protecting the people. I mean, ultimately, that's that's what every government first and foremost responsibility is to its people. What does this mean for the administration's position that these sanctuary cities should not be existing nationally? Will you still take action that denies funding to cities nationwide? Well, again, I think it's a positive sign. I hope more follow the governor's lead. Um, but um, we're going to do exactly what the president said and follow through on the executive orders he's made major. So, Sean, you mentioned um, Director Clapper's testimony yesterday. Mm -hmm. said no evidence of collusion. But then he was also asked if he was aware of the FBI counterintelligence investigation. He said he was not. And therefore, he left the impression before the panel he could not give a definitive answer about the question of collusion. Do you accept that as a valid representation of his knowledge and the fact that this remains an open question? Sure. I mean, in the sense I'm not going to question, but I think the, the interesting thing is on all the other issues that he testifies about, everybody takes it as whole cloth that if he says anything, he must try. He was the DNI. So when you guys want him to speak for the entire 17 agencies, you sort of assume that that's what he's doing. In this case, you know, when he's been asked similar questions before, um, and said, well, I can't speak to this case. Generally speaking, I've seen nothing. Uh, the presumption is, therefore, he's got to be saying it. In this case, he's saying, I have not and continue to do not see anything that shows an effort of collusion. As the DNI, I would ask you the same question, which is, at some point, given all that he was seen and all that he was given access to, when at some point are you guys going to accept this idea that there was no collusion? I'm asking you if you accept what he testified, equally, sure. that they have equal weight, that yes, at the time he said he f and the agency said they found no evidence, that is a, a representative fact that you take as valid, and it's also a representative fact that you take as valid. He was not aware of an FBI counterintelligence investigation, and therefore at this time cannot say conclusively there was no collusion. You give them equal weight, correct? Sure. Okay, fine. On Afghanistan, because I think it's important what the President's thinking about. You've been implying that ISIS is a part of the Afghanistan equation. And I'm, I'm, what I want to ask you about is as the President looks in Afghanistan, as a team presents him options, are those options primarily about whatever ISIS component is in Afghanistan or the larger, more malignant issue in Afghanistan, which has always been the Taliban? Right. So there's, as you know, multiple missions going on to confront those multiple things. The U.S. currently has about 8,400 forces in Afghanistan doing a counterterrorism operation, which is Operation Freedom Sentinel, and then the NATO mission, which is to train, advise, and assist under Operation Resolute Support. The main objective of us being in Afghanistan uh, from being used as a safe haven for terrorists to attack the United States and our allies, that is the main objective. Uh, we remain very focused on the defeat of al-Qaeda, its associates, as well as the defeat of ISIS-K. Uh, which is the a ISIS uh, affiliate there in Afghanistan. But that's, that's, that is simply put what the mission is going okay. forward. And when you suggest that it's a Washington question to ask if 15,000 can do a better job than 100,000, are you suggesting that the ideas the President is being presented with are so original and no, so no, no. All out of the box that 15,000 troops can achieve what 100,000 deployed very shortly after 9-11? Could not achieve. No, I'm just suggesting that I think fully refining the mission, what we're seeking to achieve, and that goes back to what Mara was saying, what is the exact objective, how far away are we doing it, what's the time level that we have to have, can we grow the Afghan force, is there a, I mean, there are several things that go into a strategy. And I think the idea of just saying, can we throw X number at it, is not the way that the President's looking at these options. He's trying to figure out, walk back from from a, from a goal of, defe uh, of, of eliminating this threat, and then tell me how we get there, as opposed to tell me how many troops we need and then what you're going to do with them. I think that there has been, in the past, you know, some instances of just figuring, okay, if we add more troops, that'll help solve the problem. The President's asking to re-look re at the entire strategy um, and then figure out what, what the footprint is in a, in a variety of ways to get there. That, that is a different look at what the strategy is versus what it had been. Last thing, you suggested that when Sally Yates refused to enforce the executive order, that vindicated the assumption you had that she might not have been a, a purely well-motivated government servant bringing over this evidence about Michael Flynn. On the other side of that, after Don McGahn looked at the evidence on February 2nd, was in fact Sally Yates' warning vindicated? 
I don't know. Well, I don't know what Don saw, so I, I'm not that privy to that. You, you told us that led to his firing, so it had to have some legitimacy, right? No, what led to his firing was that he had misled the vice president. But wasn't that information about uh, those Again, I can't get into, I cannot get into, and I don't know, frankly, what was in those materials. Should the country not assume that she was vindicated <laughs> I, I by that review of the evidence? No, I, I don't think they, they should assume anything. I think facts should guide it, and the bottom line is the president fired him uh, for misleading the vice president, and he was, that's, I, I just said to you, Major, multiple times, and I said at the time, so to go back, at the time that it happened, and right now, we are continue to say that the vice president was misled by General Flynn, and the president asked for his resignation. Full stop. John. Uh, Sean, if I could come back to Paris. Uh, you can. It's my understanding that the, uh, Let's all go. <laughs> and, and one other one after that, too. Uh, it's my understanding that the president's initial inclination was to pull out of the Paris Agreement. It suggested as much on the campaign trail but that the situation has become a little bit more complicated. But the, the knock against the Paris Agreement is that it would have a detrimental effect on the U.S. economy if fully implemented. Does the President believe that there is a way to stay in the Paris Agreement, maybe renegotiate the standards? Because he's under a tremendous amount of pressure from many of his own advisors, other countries, to stay in this agreement to some degree. Does he think he can make changes and still stay in it? I think um, the reason that he's seeking the advice of his team is to get options and then he'll pursue the best one. But I'm not going to tell you which one uh, that he's going to do. That's why he's continuing to meet with the team and to get advice. That's it, plain and simple. Steve. Well, hang on, I got one other oh, yeah. uh, Also, what, uh, in the omnibus spending bill that the President <coughs> signed was a provision to uh, extend the EB-5 uh, visa program. And it's been pointed out that the company that Jared Kushner was recently uh, in charge of has been aggressively reaching out to people uh, in China to say, invest in our property in Jersey City, remember the EB-5 program, the people that invest a certain amount of money in this country get the sort of golden visa program. Does the President see any potential conflict of interest there? I think Jared, Jared has no affiliation with that company anymore. He recused himself from it, sold his interest in it. Um, so that, that's a question more for uh, the company itself to ask. So the president doesn't see any potential conflicts here? No, I mean, the, the Jared did everything that was required to make sure that he recused himself and took all the steps necessary. Steve. Just before the briefing, you put out a statement, Sean, that congratulates. Thank uh, you for bringing that up. Uh, right. Korean, yes. Uh, Moon, the liberal who ran in, in South Korea, he had actively campaigned uh, suggesting that the president's idea that South Korea pay its fair share of the THAAD missile system is a bad idea. Uh, he wants warmer relations with the North. Uh, do you hope to convince him to change his mind? I think the President looks forward to meeting with him uh, and talking about our shared interests. Uh, so I'll wait for that conversation and we'll, I'm sure we'll have a readout for you. Second question. Okay. Uh, you did say that the President has an excellent relationship with the National Security Advisor, but there's been a widely circulating column written by Eli Lake that right. quotes the President, two sources, saying that the, his National Security Advisor is the general undermining my policy. Did the President say that? No, I don't believe he has. I haven't seen him. I was with. I, I mean, I think when you look at the president's schedule uh, this week, as I just noted to Sarah a little while ago, uh, there's probably no one aside from family members that are spending more time with the president this week uh, than General McMaster. He values his counsel. Uh, he continues to be extremely pleased with his pick and his performance as national security advisor, and he has the utmost confidence in him. Sure. Tulu. Thank you, Sean. Um, just a couple more questions on General Flynn. Uh, you keep saying that uh, the White House was given a heads up by Sally Yates uh, about what General Flynn uh, had said to the Russians. Um, she described it differently, saying that she told the White House that that uh, General Flynn had been uh, compromised by the Russians and was subject to blackmail by the Russians. Is that the position of the White House now, after seeing all the same evidence that Sally Yates saw, that General Flynn was compromised and potentially blackmailed by the Russians? I, I think, look, we, we've commented on this. We made a decision based on um, actions that he took. We, the president asked for and accepted his resignation. We're not looking to relitigate this. Don't the American people deserve to know whether or not they're they, they need to know that the president took decisive action uh, in this country's best interest. And, and back to Steve's question, made an excellent choice for national security advisor. By a foreign adversary. I, I don't know that you'll know. I mean, that's up for the – that's up for – To that uh, conclusion. She now. didn't – I think that's I, – I, I don't know that that's – for her to come to that conclusion. Uh, without any investigatory method, it seems a little premature, don't you? I mean, to say that. Uh, hold on, no, no. But what I'm saying is. Did the White House investigate whether or not their national security I, all gonna, As I've said multiple times, Russians. we looked into the situation. The President made a decision, and it was the right decision. Jonathan. Um, uh, Sean, a, a follow up on that, but, but first I wanted to ask you about uh, Director 
FBI Director James Comey's testimony mm -hmm. um, uh, before the Senate, uh, which now apparently uh, it looks like the FBI Director gave inaccurate testimony to the Senate. Is the White House concerned that he uh, greatly exaggerated uh, or, or misstated what kind of contact uh, Huma Abedin had in terms of her emails and sending them to uh, Anthony Weiner? I, I have not asked. Uh, the president or the staff about that. But I mean, I think there's the one issue is I don't think there's any question um, by any account that uh, that there was classified information inappropriately shared on an unclassified system to an uncleared person. I mean, that's to me, I think what continues to be the takeaway. But is the White House concerned that the FBI director apparently gave inaccurate testimony? I, I don't, at this point, I have not uh, asked and I'm not fully aware of this. I mean, I'm aware of the testimony that occurred um, and the inquiries, but I've yet to. Uh, to follow up on that, and I'd be glad to follow up. Does the President still have confidence, full confidence in FBI Director James Comey? I have no reason to believe. I haven't asked him. So I, I don't, I have not asked the President since the last time we spoke about this. And the last time you spoke about it, you said he did have confidence, but you're not sure to say that again now? Well, I, I don't, in light of what you're telling me, I don't want to start speaking on behalf of the President without speaking to him first. And then one follow up on Flynn. The, the, the President, of course, has said that Flynn should ask for immunity before agreeing to testify. Does he still I think uh, believe that? I think uh, General Flynn should seek the advice of counsel and take their advice uh, with respect to, to his uh, investigation and the inquiries into his background. But that's, that's a decision for him and his counsel. Thank you guys very much. Have a great day.